What is going on guys? It's Dre from Ambot Tuned. I know it's been a while since I posted on this channel, but it's three o'clock in the morning and I was looking back at the old Ambot Tune channel that I haven't posted on in so long and decided that I should redo some things and make the channel alive again. So I'm primarily gonna try to make this channel into somewhat of a tuning channel, but I wanted to make a new walkthrough of the tuning process because I know a lot of you guys were watching the old video, which was somewhere here. Where did it go? Right here. There's, uh, I, Alrighty. I, most of the tuning, um, emails that get sent out, they all point them to this channel. That is why it has so many views. 21k um, I have a lot of people watching the video, but I want to Kind of better explain it especially like the newer process and You can kind of sometimes relate this to other tuners as well that do e-tunes um, I have a pretty Organized process for the most part and I think a lot of the tuners most of the time will follow that same type of process. So back then when I made this, it was, everything was done email. There was no ticket system or anything like that. So I wanted to kind of redo everything. That way I have a new e-tuning process work through. So starting out, right? Going to a tuner site or even my site, um, most of us, when you're deciding about e-tuning, I decided to put up this page right here before you even get to selecting tunes to kind of answer a lot of the common questions that I get. So the first question that I normally get is how is the e-tune process done? Um, so normally while doing the e-tuning process, you would normally talk out and reach out to a tuner to make sure that they can even initially tune the car at first. And then they would point you to their site, tell you what tune they need you to order or purchase. And it kind of just goes on from there, right? So normally this, the, the simplified version of how it goes is the base once the tune is ordered the the base map and instructions that the tuner supplies such as me uh would be sent out to the customer now that email might look like let me try to bring something up that's very similar um So yes, it'll look something like this. So you'll get a confirmation email, obviously, when you order the tune, and then it's up to the tuner to get you the map back in a timely fashion manner. And it'll look something like this when you get the base map, right? So I have my instructions here that every customer needs to follow, and just a little warning right here saying, Hey, if the, the car is running weird, even though the instructions go and say to do a watt pull, don't sit there and go do a watt pull if the car is running weird, right? Um, and you'll have the base map attached. So you'll get that email and you'll follow the instructions. Uh, part of the simplified process of how eTune works is the tuner will send you a base map with instructions, you will follow those instructions. I would highly recommend that you read those instructions to the T and read everything. I get it, it can be a lot of instructions, but at the end of the day, the tuner will mention everything that you need to know or possibly answer questions that you're probably going to want answers to. And if the tuner um, did the instructions correctly, everything should be in there after tuning a lot of cars so they kind of know 
what type of questions get asked. Um, so you would follow those instructions and you're going to go through the whole tuning process of doing the logs and meaning you're going to go do out the logs. So you're probably going to do an idle log to make sure that the car at idle is running perfectly fine. You're probably going to do a driving log, just normal, casual driving as you would out in the city. And then you'll probably end up doing a cruising log, probably fifth or sixth gear and just at like 3k rpm steady throttle to make sure that if you're ever on the highway everything checks out and then the fun part is doing the watt pool now most of the time these watt pools are done in third gear when related to subaru on the streets and i say that because there are some customers that ask well if you're tuning the sti why are you not using fourth well, there's a very good reason for that because third and fourth gear are not too far off and trying to do a fourth gear pull out on the street, uh, you're taking a lot more risk to go up that fast, like in mile an hour to go up that fast on a possibly busy street. So I wouldn't recommend doing a fourth gear pull unless you know that you can be completely safe about doing it. And pretty much that's why most of the tuners will suggest just doing third gear. It's the quickest gear to get through. You're still going pretty fast, but not as fast. <laughs> um, you'll send those logs through the access port or open source. So you'll take the logs, you'll take the access port home or on your laptop, load them, uh, you would download access port manager if you're using a Cobb access port and you would upload the logs to your computer and then reply to that email with the logs. The tuner will then, once he receives the email from you, he will go through all the logs and then tell you the next step of instructions. Most of the time, if the idle driving and cruising are good, you're probably only going to do that once or twice unless that tuner sees something wrong with the car now you're probably going to do that a couple of times which moves on to question number two how long does an e-tune take so typically i can only really speak for myself but i feel that it's probably the same for other tuners that Overall, it depends on the both of us. My availability, your availability. Sometimes I have customers that get them done very, very fast. And then other times I have customers that take a little bit of time to do them because of work and they're busy. So that is the more easier way to do it. Um, but the time it takes, I've had customers' cars get done in a day, just in a couple hours. I've also had tunes going on for a month, almost two months. It's always a possibility, just depending on both the tuner and customer's uh, time that they have to spend on that car. So normally for a single map e-tune, which is just a single fuel for like a basic setup, you're probably looking at five to ten uh, maps. So going back and forth with logs about five to 10 maps before you're fully completed. Some cars just act super good and you can kind of just throw everything at it at once and it runs as it should. Some cars are a little more finicky, maybe bad fuel, maybe there's issues, things like that. So it might be pushed out to 10. I've had a couple cars go past 10, up to 20, because the car was just super finicky. So it really just comes down to the time the tuner has and the customer and if the car is doing what it's supposed to be doing. So if parts were installed correctly, maintenance was done, all that, um, it, the time frames can vary. When we're talking about flex fuel maps or dual maps, if you can't use a flex fuel sensor, you're probably looking at seven to 15 maps on average, depending. Um, like I said, I've had flex fuel maps 
take 10 maps, the same as the single map. It just honestly, it all always just depends. Um, overall, the eTune process can take anywhere from a couple of hours up to a month or two months. And that's where it's kind of more convenient for the customer. If the customer knows that he's super busy and wants to do the logs himself and not go to a shop, then the eTune process works out very perfect for them. If you're a customer that wants something done super duper quick, you can still get that done with an eTune. It's just a little bit more harder because there's only a select few of top e-tuners for the platform and those tuners that you might get recommended to will have a very big clientele list and it really just depends. Um, time limits, on to the next thing, number three. What is the time limit that I have to complete the tune? I personally, I can't speak for other tuners, but I personally give customers a month to finish the tune. Meaning, sometimes I will let a customer buy a tune ahead of time if they're waiting on parts to take part of sales or whatnot. But the day that you send your first logs is when your initial first month begins. So I try to get tunes done within a month and I give customers that amount of time. Now there are times where it goes farther than that and I kind of try to help customers out because I understand situations happens, accidents, time needed to be away, things like that. So I try to give uh, the customer a very relaxed tuning thing as long as they keep me updated. That's my biggest thing. I think it takes 10 seconds to send a quick email saying, hey, this is what's going on, this is just the update, boom. I've had customers in the past buy a tune, send the first logs, and then a year later, they message me back saying, hey, I'm ready to finish the tune. And I normally make those customers buy retunes. I don't charge them the full price, but you need to understand that most e-tunes have a time limit and a, and the cob software or certain things are always being updated so that map might not work so a new base map has to be sent and all of that good stuff on to the next question of when should i order e-tune i see a lot of customers that um i have personally I have a lot of customers that talk to me about ordering an e-tune and saying that they're going to install parts and they try to wait last minute to the last day that they're actually installing the parts or waiting until after they install parts i would highly recommend if you're going to an e-tuner that is popular per se if they're popular order the tune as soon as possible and I'm saying that because there are times where I am super backed up. And if you wait it until Saturday on the weekend to install your parts, and then you go buy the tune expecting to get the, the base map and instructions that day, I've had customers having to wait. So the earlier that you buy the tune, the sooner that you're giving that tuner enough time to get you the base map and it's already ready to go so when you do finally install the parts you already have the base map for the parts that you're going to install in the car so it's not a big issue now um where was i getting to do, 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 do. yes so number five is what is the best tuning solution for me now, me as a tuner, I sell different types of tunes. I sell an OTS map, which is almost similar to the Cobb OTS maps, but a little, just a little bit more power. If you're looking for power numbers, the OTS is not for you. It's just minor adjustments that I've made 
for certain people that don't want to spend the money on a full tune because they're just adding an intake or something like that. Um, so that is something that I've tested on multiple cars and I sell that as a package deal to customers. Now, the single map e-tune is for customers that are looking for the power in a good overall daily driven car that they want dialed in, making the best possible power while being reliable. Those single map e-tunes are for a single fuel. So whether you're running 91 or 93 or E30 or E60. I have the flex or dual map, depending on if your car has a flex sensor or if it has a dual map. I do those as well. Those are technically two in one and meaning that there are two maps, one for pump gas and then one for E60 normally or E85 mixed into one. Or you have the dual map, which is two separate maps for two separate fuels. Um, the retune is for prior customers that add parts later on after getting the initial tune and that's normally discounted at a rate for them returning back to that tuner. Now, when you're picking the tunes, obviously this is all straightforward, so I don't really have to go through that, but I kind of wanted to mention this part because those are very common answers. And then I'm also gonna add, a lot of people ask E-Tune versus Dyno. You can still get the same results that you would on a dyno from an e-tuner as long as it's the right tuner. There's never really no difference unless you're going from a dyno, a good dyno tuner to a bad e-tuner or a good e-tuner to a bad dyno tuner. That's where the fluctuation goes. Now, obviously the dyno, dyno is much more safer there's less problems and you don't really have to worry about hitting anybody or the car crashing unless one of the dyno stripes break. But it's overall the quickest and best way to do the tuning process. But there's cars that you tune on the dyno that make the power and everything like that but now when you take it out on the street, it starts acting weird. So that's why some people like e-tuning instead because it's real world um, adjustments made done to the car. So obviously the e-tune is done on the street. There's a little bit more risk involved, the police or hitting somebody, other objects, things like that. So it really just comes down to what you're more comfortable with and what you can do in your area. Because obviously if you go out to like Kansas, there's long stretches of road everywhere or Texas. If you go to, if you're like somewhere in New York, it's a little bit more impossible to get a full E-tune done. I've had it, I've had a lot of customers from New York. Um, I don't know how they do it, but they managed to do it. <laughs> so it, it really just comes down to what you want. Now onto the e-tuning process. So if you follow these instructions, you end up coming to this page right here, at least for my site. Now, I have, a, I have a tuning fact page, whatever the case is, but I have tuning instructions. I have, I just added this app, by the way. I have tuning instructions for open source because it's a little bit different situation. It's similar but different programs, different files, things like that. So I actually separated the two between Cobb and open source. But I'm gonna go through the Cobb version first. That way you can um, fully understand because a lot of my customers are on Cobb. So when you first click the link, you're gonna come to a welcome letter that kind of explains um, my tuning times and the days that I'm technically closed, right? So I kind of, in the welcome letter, I try to make it known all the main information that I want you to know beforehand, like 
the tuning times don't expect an email outside of that even though I still do send emails outside of those times or even on the weekends it's because I try to satisfy my customers and make sure that they're satisfied now when we look at I try to during the tuning process I rather customers keep questions till the end of the tune because when you're sitting there having to explain questions that possibly are already answered or will be answered, it takes up a lot of time. So with somebody like me that has a huge clientele list, any questions, just try to keep it to the end. Um, if there's any issues, obviously I want you to bring those up. But questions about certain things, leave those to the end. That way I can get to and through everybody in a timely manner. So, when you're starting the E-Tune, you're gonna go through all this. Um, I try to make my customers understand that during the tuning process, I have a high value, like volume, of customers so if you don't get a reply within a day or two days or three days I'm probably a little bit backed up but the thing different with me is I read all tickets or emails from oldest to newest so if you send a log on Monday morning and you don't get a reply back by Monday night right and I wasn't tuning on Tuesday when I start when I start tuning I might start on Monday morning if that's the oldest ticket but on Monday nights you decided to update your ticket now when I start on Tuesday uh, Tuesday morning I'm gonna start on Monday morning so you would have got a reply a lot faster but now since you replied Monday night you have to wait until I get to that point since I read all the emails and everything from oldest to newest. I did that because I had a lot of customers try to bump up their ticket and they were trying to just get ahead and get their stuff done faster. And I thought that was kind of wrong for the people that actually follow the instructions and get things done. So. I decided to do it that way. It's the most easiest way because now you have customers that actually follow directions and their tune gets a lot, done a lot faster. But if you're constantly replying to the ticket, you're technically moving yourself to the end of the line on your own. Um, normally when I start e-tuning, I'll talk to people on Facebook or text messages. But when tuning starts, I like to keep everything in one area. I don't like doing phone calls or still talking on Facebook because I get a lot of messages. I don't know what car um, we're talking about because I'm tuning a lot of cars. So what, what I mean by that is you can even like all tickets, like there's just a lot of cars that I'm tuning like here it's 248 some of those I still have to go through there are most I think most of them are done I just haven't closed them out fully but I don't know what car we're talking about if you just randomly send me a message on Facebook or you text me so I'd rather keep everything in one email chain so I keep track of everything that's being said and what's being sent and I know exactly what car we're talking about so once you're done with this you'll move on to step two which is before tuning for cop now this is where I kind of explain that you need to use common sense when doing these logs or before you start tuning up anything don't be stupid don't try to do a wide open third gear walk pool in a very busy street or anything like that. I don't condone any of that. Find a, 
a place where you can actually do. When I would tune the cars in, in person, I would go and drive like 30 minutes from my house in Orlando to go to an area where it was like somewhat of a highway, but not a highway. But I could just make U-turns and U-turns and U-turns. And I would make sure that there was no cars in the area. So just use common sense. Don't do anything stupid. Um, I also make it very clear not to do any wide open throttle pulls until we get to that step. I have a lot of customers that tend to get the tune and start just ripping on it. But I not recommend that because even though I know the base map that I send you is safe, something could be hooked up in the car wrong. And there's a difference between doing one third gear watt pull just one time compared to doing it many times and not knowing an issue is actually there. So on this step, you'll pretty much, uh, you have to have a laptop and computer in order to get everything done and clear. And you need to be able to download Access Port Manager. So when you click on this, you will have, if it loads, it's just taking forever, you have to download whether you have a Mac or Windows. You're pretty much just gonna download that program. Um, it kind of just goes through the steps. Um, with the USB cables, if you don't have the Cobb USB cable, you sometimes can't use a random micro USB cable. Some of the micro USB cables are for charging only and don't um, have the data wiring in them. So that's why sometimes you will connect a Cobb access port without being able for it to be recognized on your computer. So you might have to try a couple of micro USBs before you find the right one that has data in order for the computer to recognize the access port. I don't have an access port here with me right now, so I can't really like show you, but do I even have access port manager on here? I don't even think I do. No, I don't. So pretty much when you connect your access port to the access port manager, it's gonna ask you to update it. Update the access port. Despite what anybody tells you, just update it, okay? Just make everybody's life easier. Just update it, don't worry about it. Um, I tell people to go to my fact page just to kinda look through, cause it might answer a question that you have. Now, on this step, I make sure to kinda list, please make sure that all the parts are listed Make sure all the parts that you listed on the tuning sheet when you ordered the tune are on the car when you flash the base map. I have some customers that kind of forget. And I have to not necessarily waste time, but I have to make more time to make another map because either parts didn't come in or something like that. So try to plan ahead when it gets to that point. Now... If you're, so if you're stage two with a 2015 plus FA20, if you're not installing the EBCS, you need to make sure that you remove the boost pill out of the stock EBCS. And you can easily find that by going to Google. 2015 WRX boost pill. And it's like the first link that pops up. Uh, actually, you know what? Maybe they got rid of it. Because there used to be a page right at the top that explained everything on it. I know that um, Fat Body has it on here. Um, yeah, so this was actually on the... Um, this used to be a part of another website. The picture's here. So it's the... There's three hoses, one goes to the turbo, one goes to the wastegate, and one goes to the intake. And the one that goes to the wastegate, there's this little pill in there. You need to remove that 
some people removed the other pill, which I think is in the turbo one, if I recall correctly, and that doesn't work. You need to remove the one that goes to the wastegate if you're not installing an EBCS. If you're installing an EBCS, then you're not gonna have the issue because you're gonna remove that whole system out anyway and put new hoses and things like that. Um, make sure that you have the correct fuel in the car. I can't stress this out enough. There's been times where I've had customers order an E60 or E32. I send them the base map. The title of the tune says E30 or E60. And the map notes say E30 or E60. They flash the base map and I get the logs back and I'm like, what the hell's going on with your car? Well, it's because when I ask them, sometimes they still have pump gas in the car. Do not do that. At least with my base maps, I make it dummy proof and I don't run all the boost or all the timing that you can run on E30 or E60 as the base map. So even if a customer goes out and does a log on like on an E30, on 93, the car will still run. It's just not gonna make any power. It's gonna be low on boost. So I make it dummy proof and more safe for the car just in case if there is a user error of some sort. So after that, once you understand all of this, and like I said in the beginning, I know it's a lot. When you look at this, you're like, yo, I'm not reading all this. But if you read everything, most of the time, your questions will be answered and you can save the car from being damaged. You would move on to number two. So when you get this email over here, where did it go? When you get this initial email, this is the initial base map. Your tuner will have it named a certain way. You have to download this tune to your computer, to the download folder or wherever you please to put it. And you would open up Access Port Manager. You would connect the Access Port to the computer and it will pop up on Access Port Manager. It will tell you to update it. Just update the Access Port. And on the program, this is a brand new computer, so I don't have it actually here, but you would technically take that tune, once you download it, say like this, you would open the file and you would literally drag it over to the program. If the program was open up right here, you would just take it and drag it. And depending on the version of map that you're using, you could get a message saying, the map isn't for the current car, hit yes, because sometimes there's different map versions that work and do not work. They work, but it will say that it's not for the current car, even though it's made for that car. It just might be a different frameware or version number. So you just have to hit yes, and now the the, the map is now on the access port. So then once the map is on the access port, you can technically, I'm not gonna say this yet. I would recommend that you click on access port manager. I would go to data logs and I would delete every single log that you have on there. I've had people with like 500 logs, whatever the case is. I would just delete every single logs under data log tab in access port manager. That way you can start completely fresh. And then now, once you have the access port on, you can remove it and you can move on to the next step, which is flashing the map to the car. So you're gonna plug the, AP, so you're gonna go out to your car, you're gonna plug the AP in to the OBD port. And then you're gonna turn the key to on. So, 
accessory on, but engine off. The access port should turn on. And you're going to go down to reflash. Or you're gonna to go to the tune menu. You so see you on the access port, you're gonna you know click down, go to the tune menu, and then you'll have a you'll have a option for real time and then reflash. You always want to use reflash. Reflash um, makes adjustments to all the tables, everything like that. Real time only makes adjustments to a certain amount of tables. Some of the tables are not always uh, the same. And what I mean by that is, wait a minute, so I can actually show you guys. Uh, where did it go? So here, you'll have some of these tables that are like this, that have the B and R, which mean that the red is real time. So all these tables can be adjusted in real time, but there's also tables like this that are, or actually I can't use those for say, but like these in black, those cannot be in real time. They are only for reflash. So if you make an adjustment to these tables, if you do, if you make adjustments to these tables and you real time it, it doesn't apply the thing. So just always make sure that you use reflash. You'll follow the instructions on the access port. And if I remember correctly, it will ask you if you want to flash the map. You'll say yes, and then it will start the process, and then it will tell you to turn off the car for a certain amount of time. And then it will go through that. And then it will tell you to turn back on the car, but engine off, but accessory on, engine off. And then it will tell you to turn it back off for 10 seconds. You need to make sure that you wait those 10 seconds before actually starting the car. Uh, sometimes if you don't wait the 10 seconds and you instantly try to start the car, the car will always have issues starting the first time because it needs to relearn everything. Um, even sometimes happens even if you wait the 10 seconds, but there's less of a chance. So you have to have, make sure that the base map is flashed before moving on to the next set. So depending on whether you have an EJ or FA20, you would use this data log parameters list. Or if you have FA20, there's different parameters that you need to log, so I have a separate thing for that. Um, you need to understand that if you have something on the gauge menu on the Cobb access port, it doesn't necessarily mean that when you hit the log button that it's going to log what you show on the gauge. So you need to follow these steps where you go to the gauges and you hit the up button until it highlights the setup uh, parameter and you hit the center button and then you hit configure data logging. All of these items is what normally you need to log for um, any e-tuner. Some e-tuners will add more things or remove things, but this is the general list that we need. And depending on the version model of the tune, um, boost and boost extended, the car could have both. It could have boost, but not boost extended. It could also have boost extended, but not boost. It just depends on the map version that the tuner has sent you. Um, it might even be manifold relative pressure and not boost or boost extended. Same with RPM. It could be RPM or it's going to be engine speed. 
It's going to be one of the two. Um, and then you move on to what the gauge is. Um, these could be different, but this is for me. I like having on the gauges the air fuel sensor. That way you can see if it goes lean or not during the watt process. I like having boost or manifold relative pressure or boost extended. And that will show the max boost that the car sees during the logs. Um, dynamic advanced multiplier, you need to make sure that you have that added. Um, if you see that drop, it kind of would tell you right away, like, hey, ease off the car, don't, don't beat on it, don't do anything crazy. Feedback knock, so that way you can see if there's any knock happening. And on the gauges, it will show like a min and max at the bottom. So you can kind of see after you pushing it hard if the values go too negative or anything like that. Um, find knock learns the same thing and intake temp. Intake temp, that way you can monitor anything over like a hundred and actually a hundred degrees. Um, you're probably going to have knock and things like that, but you probably shouldn't beat on the car that much. At idle, if you sit there at idle for a long time, this number will go up into the hundreds until you start driving. Then it will, most of the time it instantly goes down once you actually start driving. So if you have an open source car and you have like an old car, like an O2, I think it does it up until 05, if I recall correctly. Sometimes if you add too many data log items, it'll tell you that you need to remove the byte. And this is where I have a list of things that you can remove. And if I need it later, I will tell you to add it back but it won't let you log until you reduce the number of um, data log parameters that you have or, you, or you're using. Now, once you have all that set, now with all these on the configured data log, you should have a blue, if I recall correctly, I think it's blue, it might be green, but you should have a dot next to all of these things. If you have a dot next to all these things, that means that when you hit the log button, it's going to record all of that data for the tuner to see. Um, same process goes for the FA24. It's just different. Um, some of it's just different language, um, different names for things. And this is what I need for that. So the biggest point is how to do data logs. So once again here, I mention again, do the watt log, do all four logs. I require idle, driving, cruising, watt log. Do all the logs, unless you're having issues, then obviously don't do the watt log. Um, like I said, have common sense. The car's running really, really bad. Don't do the watt log, right? And then you would send me all the logs at the same time, not individually, all at the same time, unless you're having issues with the car. And obviously you might send three if you're having issues and didn't do the watt log, or you might be having issues at idle and might just do one. So for the idle log, when you first start up the car, you're gonna just let it idle. You can record the cold start if you want, but you're gonna do an idle log for like five minutes, right? So you're gonna let the car warm up. Um, this waiting for ABCS intake, when you first start the car after a fresh reflash, the AFR sensor and ABCS intake has to go through a calibration process after a fresh reflash. And it does it pretty quick, but if you flash a car and then instantly start driving it after a reflash, it takes a little bit for it to actually calibrate. So that's why I tell any of my customers, if you're just reflashing the car for the first time, 
Make sure to wait at idle before touching the throttle at all for at least five minutes. That way everything calculates. Because if it doesn't, um, you'll have a watt pull where the AFR sensor is not working and the car is running at 14.7 AFR when it should be at like 11 if on pump gas. So obviously that's gonna cause knock, possible dam drops. Um, also, it can also cause negative numbers for timing if you don't wait long enough. Uh, which, is a, which is pretty much explained here. Wait for the AFR sensor to warm up. Um, it will stay a solid 14.7 if it's not um, calibrated yet or fully warmed up. Once it's warmed up or calibrated, it will start moving. You might see 14.5, 14.7, 15. It might just cycle right in that like little range. So on the Cobb Access port, you'll go to the gauges menu and you'll hit the middle button. You're not doing anything with the car. You're literally starting it, letting it warm up, not touching the throttle, and you're hitting the logger button and letting it log, log for at least four minutes. Once those four minutes are up, you're gonna hit the logger again, the big button in the middle, and that will stop it. That will save a data log. And if you followed my instructions before of deleting all the rest of the data logs and you didn't take any other data logs before that, that should be named data log one. Then you'll go to the driving log. If everything seems fine with the idle log, there's no issues, you move on to the driving log, which is you just casually driving around the city. You might get in a little bit of boost, you might come off the throttle, things like that. Just normal driving, coming to stops. Here we're checking if the normal driving um, is perfect and it doesn't need any adjustments. So you'll pretty much drive around in a normal fashion for four to five minutes. It's fine if the time takes a little bit longer and then you'll stop the logger. And once again, if you followed the instructions before, you already did the idle log, so you'll have data log one and then the driving log should be data log two. Then you'll move on to the cruising, just driving out to the highway, putting the car in fifth or sixth gear at four or 3K or 4,500 at a steady throttle. Whatever you can possibly make happen. I know some people in the city, it's kind of hard to do that, but you'll do that for like four or five minutes and then you'll stop the logger. Now you should technically have three data logs on your access port. Uh, next is the fun part. If everything seems fine with the cruising log, driving log and idle log. And I put it in that order for a reason. Um, idle log, if there's an issue there, obviously you're not gonna do the driving log or cruising or walt log because if it's having issues at idle, it's probably gonna have more issues actually driving the car. Um, if the car is doing good at idle, driving and cruising, most likely you're going to be able to do the walt log with no issues. So when you get to the watt log, I kind of put things in bold that some people still tend to miss out. So I want to better explain that. So majority of Subarus that I tune are basic stage one, stage two, sometimes stage three that are normally staying under 23 PSI. Most of the time the ranges are from 18 PSI or well 14 PSI all the way up to about 22. That is the average unless you have a bigger turbo or a built motor, things like that. And I would tell you that we're gonna go target more PSI than that. Most of y'all should follow this right here, okay? If at any point during the test, if it generates more than 23 PSI, please 
for the love of tuning gods, lift off the throttle. I can't explain how many times I've gotten log of the car making more than 23 PSI and the customer kept his throttle 100% the whole time. Luckily, most of those times, I would say a good 95% of the time, nothing damaging happens if you just do it once, but you have some customers that tend to, mm, let me do one or two or three or four watt locks at that. You're probably gonna damage something. So if it goes over 23, just please let off the throttle. And it takes a quick second just to look at the boost. And if you see it hit 23, boom, off the throttle. Stop the log and send that log revision in that way I can make an adjustment or find out what's going on. It's not always a tuning issue, but it could be, or the EBCS could be hooked up wrong or something like that. I'll explain that better in a later video. Um, the next point is if at any point during the watt log, the car generates more than negative four feedback knock or dam drop from one, lift off the pedal just lift off of it it takes a quick second to just look at the access port while you're doing these locks just to see what it's doing um i like i said same with the boost i've had customers i've had customers cars go like negative 10 and they're still in the throttle and i try to make it very clear in my instructions not to do that or you risk damaging something on the car. There could be many reasons that could happen, but I try to make it known. Because negative, anything up to like negative four can happen due to anything, but it's not as severe. Um, wide bands. If your car is equipped with a wide band, so if you have a 2015 FA20 or FA24, the car automatically has a wide band. You don't need to worry about that. If you have an STI, most of the time you're gonna need a wide band gauge because the wide band that shows on the access port for the STIs or older WRXs pre-2015, they do not have a wide band. It's a narrow band and doesn't read the full air fuel ratio if on pump gas say 90 91 or 90 octane or 93 or 94 normally most tuners on these cars are probably going to have them around 11.5 to 10.5 afr if the car during the watt process and you look down and you see 12 lift off the throttle <laughs> that means that the car is going lean it could be due to many different things and i'll explain that in a later video uh if you're on e e30 or technically any fuel <laughs> pump gas too if the fueling goes during the watt while it's in boost if afr shows 13 plus let off the throttle do not even you're probably going to melt something or burn something or something bad is really going to happen um also if you're doing the watt log and the car feels like it hit a wall and you're not at red line please let off the throttle just please let off the throttle <laughs> there could be many different issues. It could be negative timing. It could be that um, the requested torque tables are not set up properly. So it lowers all the power and you're just holding it there. There could be many different reasons why. But if the car doesn't just move slowly across the RPM range, just back off the throttle. So those are pretty much like the the pre-main things that I want customers to know not to do. Now, the 
third gear watt pool. So if you have an STI, you're going to put it in sport plus mode or sport sharp. CVT, you're going to put it in sport mode. Any other um, just basic model WRX, your six speed, you're going, or five speed, you're going to put the car in third gear. So you're going to find an empty road and you're going to drive up to third gear. You're going to make sure that the car is at 2500 RPM, unless I tell you otherwise. And you're going to hit the logger button at 2500. Once you hit the logger button, you are going to 100% throttle the whole time. As long as the car goes through the RPM range smoothly, everything looks good on the Cobb Axis port, meaning the boost is not over boosting. It's not going over 23 PSI. The AFR is anywhere from 11.5 to 10.5 on pump gas or 11.5 to 12.5 on E85 or E60. Um, and you're just going to do a wide open throttle pull in third gear from 2,500 all the way up to 6,500 RPM normally. Once you get up there, you're going to let off the throttle, put the car in neutral, and hit the logger and slowly just normally drive the car again. Now that that data log is saved and the watt log was done, you should only have four logs unless you mess up, but try to just remember that. Um, I don't like when customers send me 10 different logs and don't know what is what. It just wastes so much time. So just remember to do four logs that way, when you send those four logs, I already know. One's idle, one's driving, one's cruising, one's watt log. Okay? So, once this initial process is done, you will send that map back to me. And then I will send you another revision. Either I will ask you to do all four logs again, or an idle log, or driving, or just a watt log. So the next step will explain transferring the data logs to me. So when you get home, or even if you're on the side of the road with the laptop, you would connect the access port to the computer. You would open up access port manager and you would send the, you would um, go to the data log menu and it will show the list of data logs. Normally they are in order. So even if you didn't follow my recent instructions of not deleting all your prior data logs, you might have 500 data logs. The ones with the highest numbers, so it would be numbered like data log 501, 502, 503, 504. If you did four logs, it should be the four highest numbered data logs on the Cobb Access Port Manager. Those are the four logs that you need to drag over to your computer, save them to your computer. And those are the logs that you are going to send to your tuner or me. Um, I try to get my customers to rename the data logs, but what sometimes happens is when you rename this, when you put the dot, I might have to change the instructions just a little bit, but sometimes when you put the dot, it changes the file type and it makes it unreadable so sometimes I just tell people not to worry about renaming it just be very careful about this dot and just make sure that you just kind of forget this after part kind of move it before the dot <laughs> I have to put that in the instructions I'll try to fix that but um, then you will go to the support site on this site and you'll see this little support button You'll fill out your name, your email, you'll put starting tune, and you will attach the files. So if your data logs were these data logs right here, you would just attach those or, and then you would hit submit. 
what then happens is that your data log comes here to the new tickets and groups and it comes here. It's not assigned to anybody, it's just here. I will open it and then um, I'm trying to remember, but I'll, I'll see it here and then when I reply to this, it will send you an email. The email is a ticket. So let me see if I can show you exactly what it is. Oh, come on. One. Ooh, I think I forgot my password. Yeah, I forgot my password. But you'll get an email that is in a form of a ticket. That email is what you are going to reply to. You're not, when you get the second map from your tuner or from me, you're not going to go back to the support site and do this whole process again. You're not gonna do that. You're going to reply to the email that you got for the ticket. And that way, if you, if you do it this way, if you come back to the site, it's gonna make a whole new ticket. And then it kind of gets a little bit messy. So you need to reply to the email where you got the reply from me from which will include the second base map or any other questions that I have for you. That's the email that you have to send. Uh, if you purchased a launch map, those are done at the end of the tune. The launch map is pretty much a map that builds boost at idle, well, during launch control. I think the stock boost on launch control on a FA-20 is like five PSI that it builds on the launch control. This will build about 10, sometimes more if I get real spicy with it. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna go onto the Cobb Access port and you're going to set up your launch control um, to about 5,800. I can pretty much set, if you're a guy that goes to the track, I can kind of tell you where to set it at. Um, normally a lot of people just buy it for the sound it just depends on what type of tires and things like that to be able to not bog or have traction issues you would set the rpm to 5800 and once you have that set you'll back out of that menu go to gauges and at idle you'll put the clutch in you'll put it in first gear but you're not going to come off the clutch you're going to start the logger and don't just stab the throttle, okay? You need to go 100% throttle, but don't just stab it instantly. Rev it a couple times, work it up, work it up, work it up, boom. Hold it there for at least five seconds. That way the boost builds up to the point where it needs to be. And then let off the throttle, put the car in neutral, let it idle and you had already stopped the logger after that and you would kind of repeat the process of sending me the data log. So if you have purple map, purple will also be added towards the end of the tune and that works as a, uh, it works on D cell. So normally I set it to 3200 up until about 6k on D cell and if you lightly tap the throttle on D cell just doo, doo, it'll start popping I know this was a very long video but I kind of wanted to go into detail of the whole e-tuning process and an updated version because I changed a lot of things from the original thing that I posted back in 2019 when I was first starting tuning so I hope this helps majority of you guys out with the new updated things. I hope it answered a lot of like e-tuning questions. Um, I will make another video on some common
questions and answers that I have for most people. And that's that. So thank you for watching and I'll see you on the next video.